Uh, all right. Hi. Thanks for coming on out, brave in the cold, and just generally being here at MAGFest, and especially being at this part of MAGFest, which is running role-playing games for new players with Captain Mike. By an amazing coincidence, I am Captain Mike, so I'm in the right place. Uh, yeah, if, I know some people had come in afterwards, but I did want to give a brief shout out. I did get the photo from the Hero Forge website where you can make your own miniatures and all that kind of stuff. They're not paying me to say this, so I can't say that they're great. So you might say, okay, cool, we're here. We're going to learn about running role-playing games for new players, how to deal with uh, as being a GM, bringing in new players either into your own group or into, uh, into just them, into the hobby itself. But first, I thought you might want to know who's going to be talking to you about all this stuff. So here I am. I am Michael Clegg. Captain Mike is my sort of nom de guerre. Uh, I'm a presenter. I'm a teacher. Uh, I've been gaming for 30, 30 years. Uh, I have an MA in writing and a BA in English, but I'm also an actual teacher. And I find that kind of being a teacher and being a game master, they share a lot of qualities and similarities. Sometimes you have to convince people to do things that they might not have generally thought of and make sure that they thought it was their idea. Uh, I also started off role playing uh, years ago with Dungeons and Dragons. So I always think of myself as having D&D stats because I'm just kind of old fashioned and traditional. Uh, so there you go. So if you were ever wondering, oh, what kind of a constitution does Mike have? Well, turns out it's a 13. You know, I make my saves most of the time. By the way, as we go through this, if you have any questions, feel free to raise your hand or shout them out or just, you know, generally convey them in whatever manner. Uh, but otherwise, I'll kind of go through. And if you've been to, has anybody seen this slide before? Yes, that means I have some returning people or someone has been stealing my slide. And honestly, of all the slides to steal, this is, in my opinion, the best one. Uh, but yeah, first and foremost, you know, all players are people, all people are different. You, the most important advice I can give to anyone is to know your audience as best you can. That's just good advice, generally speaking, I find. But when it comes to gaming, I think it is especially important. And if you're bringing in new players, the more you know about those people before you start gaming, the easier a time I think you're going to all have. Uh, the more you can know, okay, they're into this, they're not into that, this is what they're expecting, this is what they're not expecting. Even just, you know, what do they like, what do they don't like? Anything. Knowing your audience, extremely handy. It's also handy for players to know their audience and understand the GM as well. But All right. So things to consider when introducing new players. And these are the topics that I'm going to be covering. Do you want to bring in people, uh, just an all new players, like a whole group of no one but new players? Or do you want to have some new players? Do you want to have some veterans? Mix them together, see how that works. You want to think about what game to play, which may seem obvious, but sometimes people skip that part. They're like, yeah, we want to, really want to get into role playing. And then you get down, you sit down at the table, and you're like, so what do you want to play? And everyone's like, oh, I don't know. Uh, Vampire, D&D, &D, uh, you know, well, I was about to say Starflight, but that's a video game. Um, any of the other games that I can at the moment remember. Uh, and then we're also going to kind of go through a list of things to keep in mind for your very first gaming session with these new players. So first you want to consider how do you want to bring in these new players? Now sometimes you don't get a choice. Sometimes you are a new GM and you have new players and you don't have any veteran players. Well, that makes it really easy. Uh, likewise, if you have one person who's coming in and a bunch of people who are already veterans, then it may seem obvious which way you want to go. But the most important thing to consider is what's going to make everybody comfortable. Some new players will may be intimidated by veteran players. They're coming into a system that may seem very complicated and it may, you know, certainly we're going to make things easy for them, but they may feel intimidated. They come in and if there are veteran players who just, they know stuff right off the top of their head and they're like, you know, let's go, it may be intimidating. Likewise, veteran players may not be overly thrilled to have to slow the game down to explain everything to the newbie next to them. So consider the comfort of everyone involved. Uh, you know, learn to play noob. I don't know if you've ever been with a gamer who's just like, let's go, you know, yes, we've memorized the rules. Of course, we know every single spell by heart. Let's just, you know, let's go fire off the spells, you know, have all of your stuff ready, you know, clockwork, clockwork, let's go. Uh, they can, these veterans can be very helpful because they know their stuff, but yeah, if they've got to constantly explain, no, you got to roll that dice, no, you you know, that number, you have to add this to that number. If they have to keep explaining things or if they have to wait for someone else to keep explaining things, it can be very frustrating for everyone involved. 
Uh, I find one handy thing to do, and something that I've had some significant success with, is if you're going to use a mixed group, pair someone who knows what they're doing with someone who doesn't know what they're doing. And then you can develop sort of like a you know, mentor director sort of a thing. Uh, as a GM, you know, of course, we all have a lot of things to pay attention to. We've got to you know, follow the monster stats, and we've got to figure the plot, and how we're going to deal with whatever the players just came up with. So it can be very handy for those small questions, those sort of small reminders, for a player just to be able to say to the person next to them, like, which dice am I supposed to roll? Which thing am I supposed to do? Uh, and so it can be pretty handy. Um, the, uh, uh, and so that also will not slow down the game as much, because then the new player doesn't have to interrupt what's going on. And also the new player has someone that they can just, you know, they know that that's the person that they can just ask these small questions to. Now this does rely on the person that you're pairing them with to be cool with that, because if they're not, that's not going to be very helpful. And likewise, it has to be a pairing that can work out. But knowing your audience, again, that can really help out with that. Uh, now you might say, uh, you know, Mike, is there any a special advantage to having new players and veterans next to each other? I think that the best advantage of bringing in new players to the hobby, aside from having more people to play with, is that bringing in new players brings in new perspectives and new ideas, especially if you have a gaming group that's been going for a long time and they've kind of gotten set in their ways, set in their expectations. Uh, one of my favorite examples of this is uh, I had a couple of, of friends uh, you know, way back when, when I went to college, I left my gaming group from my original high school hometown and I met some people at college and I was like, hey, yeah, you know, I played Dungeons and Dragons. They were like, oh, you know, we've you know, heard about that and we wanted to get into it. So, uh, you know, on spring break, they came and visited me in my hometown. And we set up this game and they were like, awesome, we're going to play this Dungeons and Dragons thing that, we've, thing that we've heard so much about. And I set up a classic dungeon so they could, you know, check traps every 10 feet and they could, you know, get attacked by wandering monsters. Uh, but while I was making it, uh, there were, uh, I kind of like, staggered the team, so each person kind of had, you know, new player, veteran player, new player, veteran player. Uh, and at the very beginning, the players were attacked by some kobolds. But I didn't call them kobolds, I just described them, because I just, you know, wanted to give them that extra flair. And all of the new players looked at the, at the veteran players, and they were like, what are these things? And they were like, I'm pretty sure they're kobolds. This should be no problem. Let's just get in there, hit them with swords, and sooner or later they'll fall over. And they did, and it was great. And then, but that kind of became like an interesting pattern where some monster would show up and then all of the new players would turn over and be like, what do we do? And that worked pretty well because it gave them the direction that they needed. But then they came to this one level in the dungeon and when I had been making the dungeon, I was like, oh, this kind of looks like a labyrinth. You know what every labyrinth needs? A minotaur. And I was like, ah, but a minotaur, you know, classic, ordinary. What if it was like a minotaur golem, like a steampunky kind of a thing? It's the only monster on this particular level. That could be fun. I didn't really think anything of it. It didn't have any special stats. It was a minotaur with like a different skin. Just, you know, a coat of paint. Bloop, bloop. Made like a chugga chugga noise. It had glowing red eyes. Steam shot out of it. You know, no big deal. I'm like, they're just going to go in there. The party's just going to go choppity chop. It'll be fun. That's not what happened. We get down to that level, and I describe the thing, the thing that's coming out of the, you know, you, you hear this noise in the darkness, you know, and then you see glowing red eyes and a plume of steam, and it, you know, as the eyes lock onto you, you hear a and then it starts thundering towards you, chugga, 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 chugga. And, you know, horns, eyes, it looked like a minotaur, just like a robo minotaur. And the new players were all like, what is that? And the veteran player looked over and was like, I don't know. What do we do? Run! And they spent like 20 minutes just fleeing in terror from this. They totally could have taken this thing out. Like, it wouldn't have even been a big deal. There were many more of them. They had plenty of spells. But it was hilarious. And it was just great because they were terrified out of their minds and never engaged it in combat. They had to run down corridors. They had to, like... At one point, one of them taunted it so that it would code charging after him, while the other ones like hid in an alcove so they could get by. Uh, and then, during the brief moments when they did engage in combat, it was all about not getting touched by it. Like they developed such an intense fear of it. And if it had been just my veteran players, 
you know how veteran players can be. They're like, okay, well, if we can figure out its, its armor class and we can figure out its hit points, we can figure out how long it takes to defeat it, and they can you know, use all of those skills. But new players bring that like, sparkle of the unknown, which is why I love playing with new players, why I love bringing in new people. It brings that fresh perspective and it even makes the old stuff new again for me. Uh, and it's a great way for them to you know, see this stuff that I love. Uh, so this is my story. They never did defeat it, by the way. They did, like, that Minotaur remains to, to wander about its steampunk life forever. Um, they did find the stairs down, and then they, on the way back out, they, had to, they still avoided it. Like, they had defeated way stronger stuff, and coming back, they were like, we got to remember not to, you know, piss off that Minotaur. So anyway, so mentors and directors can definitely work out. Uh, but there's nothing also wrong with doing a party of one. You have a new player, maybe you have one person who wants to come in and you have a veteran team and you know the veteran team is gonna, you know, maybe not be thrilled with having to wait for a new player to catch up. But also just being one new player in a veteran team, that's very intimidating. So maybe the new, uh, the new player just wants a chance to get to grips with this stuff, wants a chance to mess up and not have it you know, be a problem for anyone else. I myself often feel that way, it's why I don't play a lot of MMORPGs unless I can kind of sit off to the side and like goof around in the, the lower level stuff on my own. But you can just run a party of one, run a few adventures uh, just to get the person used to the system, used to how things, how things roll. No pun intended. Uh, but yeah, do a party of one, do a party of two, however many new players you have coming in and maybe you're gonna take that one party and then merge it with another one or you know what? There's nothing wrong with having a campaign of one for that matter. So you're like, all right, Mike, so I got an idea of the people that I'm dealing with. What game do we play? Now, for some of you, this is an easy answer because you only play one game. Maybe you're just, you know, I'm Dungeons and Dragons, yo, all the way. Well, that's an easy answer. You're going to play Dungeons and Dragons. Uh, but, you know, I play a wide variety of role-playing games, including many that are just homebrew systems uh, based off of other stuff. Uh, and so there are a few things to consider what you do. So first of all, the GM should know what the game is. Again, that seems like I, <laughs> it might seem kind of obvious, but I've actually like run games that I didn't know how to play. Uh, I had a group of people that wanted me to run Vampire, and at the time, I didn't know how Vampire worked. I only played Dungeons and Dragons. I, like, I kind of knew how the world worked. Um, but they were like, no, we need, a G we need somebody to, to be a storyteller, and all of us are players, and none of us like, want a GM. So I was like, well, how different could it be? The answer is significantly different. And I spent a lot of time saying, like, what would the role for that be? I ended up just basically telling all the storyteller stuff and then I had like a vizier that like did all the rolls and, and handled all the dice for me, which worked out pretty nicely. But as a GM, if you're bringing in new players, now there I was a new GM with veteran players and it worked okay, but if you've got new players, the GM really needs to be familiar with the system. And I would suggest even if you, even if the, the player definitely wants to play a particular game, if the GM isn't familiar with it, either the GM needs to take time to become familiar with it or play a different game at least until both of them, both people kind of get on the same wavelength. Uh, comfort, also a major thing. Some games are more complex and complicated than others. I think we all know that. Uh, I normally play second edition Dungeons and Dragons, which is not an easy game to walk into. I mean, it's, in some ways it is, it's just six stats, you just roll them up and it's no big deal. But if you need an explanation for like how Thacko rolls, in fact, is anybody here familiar with Thacko? Yeah, yes. I, I always miss my to hit armor class zero. What's up? Oh, it is awful. Like I really like it because of how it works mechanically, but explaining how Thacko, like to do the math for Thacko, I've, people are looking at me and they're like, you want me to do algebra? I thought this was a game. I'm like, yeah, a game with some algebra in it. Don't worry about it. Now remember your pluses and minuses and remember X could be any number. Um, so that's definitely an element. The player interest also has to be there, logically. If you're going to play a game, the player has to be into whatever's going on. Uh, now with a new player, if you've got all new players, then it can be very helpful to just be like, hey, what do you all wanna play? Now if you've got a game running and you wanna bring them into it, make sure it's a game that that player actually wants to be a part of. Maybe the player wants to get into role playing but isn't too keen on Star Wars and you're running a Star Wars game. Well, that's not gonna be a good fit. Uh, there may be some wiggle room in this. You might say, well, like, okay, 
were doing Star Wars for now, you could like sit in and see how things roll. Uh, and then we can switch from Star Wars to something else. But ultimately, if you want to bring someone into the hobby, it has to be something that they're interested in. And it might not be a specific game. You might say, like, oh, you know, what kind of, you know, what do you like? And they're like, oh, well, I really like the Marvel movies. Like, the MCU is totally awesome, and I really liked, you know, Loki or whatever. And it's like, oh, cool, we should play a superhero game. In fact, Marvel has at least two different role-playing games just for Marvel. Uh, so bringing in that player interest can really capture that, that spark. And in my opinion, when it comes to bringing in new players, I'm not just concerned with them having a good time for that one. I want, an, I want them to have such a good time that they want to play this as much as I do. I want them to make it a part of their life just as I've made it a part of mine. They don't have to, but that's my goal. All right. Mechanics. As I said, some games more complicated than others. Are, uh, are you choosing a game where the mechanics are going to just be too crunchy? Are they going to be too mathematically complicated or just too confusing to grasp uh, for someone who has to come in and understand all of this new stuff? Because there's a lot of new stuff that goes into role-playing games. There's terminology and concepts and, well, what do I do now? What can I do now? What is this? What does that mean? You don't want to have your new players constantly tripping over mechanics if they don't have to. Uh, there are a few things you can do for this. Uh, one of the things I recommend for new players is to simplify the mechanics. Just make it easier. Uh, maybe if you're doing like to hit rolls or something like that, rather than making them do all of the math, just have something set up on their character sheet ahead of time where it's just like, okay, to hit something you need to roll this or more, and then let them know if it's harder to hit than, you know, maybe harder or easier. You know, it, say like, okay, when you do damage, you roll this, and that's what it is. Uh, instead of going through a series of complicated skill checks, combine those skill checks into one roll. And if it passes, great. If it doesn't, you know, work with it. Um, anybody remember Champions, the old role-playing game? Uh, Champions was uh, a few people. Uh, I think it later became the super system. I don't know, it was one of those games that tried to be everything, but what it was at its heart was a superhero game. And making a character could take upwards of two or three hours because the math involved was so ponderous and you had to go through all this stuff. And even when I was at my best, I couldn't get one done in, in, with any level of complexity and get it in under like an hour and a half. So I would make character sheets for my new players. I would ask them what they wanted and then I would just like do all of the math and I'd be like, here you go. And it was super easy and very effective. It's especially effective if you're working with someone who's not only a new player, but maybe a younger player. Um, for a while, I was running role-playing games for um, tabletop role-playing games for a library. They had like an after-school program for the high school kids and, uh, and or high school kids. Uh, yeah, and we played champions, and I was like, hey, what kind of superhero do you want to play? What kind of powers do you want to have? You know, do you want to have any like kryptonite or flaws or whatever? And I would just make the character for them and just be like, here you go. Uh, one advantage of Champions is that it was incredibly difficult to make characters, but once they were done, super easy math. So I did all the hard work for them. I like to think they appreciated it. Uh, no, I'm kidding. They had a good time. So considering mechanics, and then also consider, is this going to be part of the campaign that you already have running if you have veteran players, or are you going to start a new campaign? Now, this can be good and bad. If you're going to continue a campaign, that can be kind of handy because then a new player comes in and there's all this stuff that's already going on. They already, there's already a group idea of what they have to do and where they're going. And they can be worked in and just be like, oh, you know, now I'm a part of this and they can, you know, listen to the backstory. They can listen to the cool war stories that the other players have and they can walk into it. On the other hand, that's a lot to take in. You know, I don't know if you've ever come to somebody else's gaming table and they're like, oh yeah, you know, come on into this game. Here's the 800 pages of backstory. Uh, I didn't know this came with assigned reading. Uh, do you have any algebra I could just do? Of words I've never said, by the way. Uh, you know, or you sit down and then, you know, it's like, okay, so then this happens to the GM's like, and then the guy pulls off his cowl and he has red hair and everybody gasps and the new player's like, what? Well, Ooh, red hair? And it's like, no, don't you know that this guy was the Archduke's second cousin who turned out to be a shapeshifter who stabbed me in issue 63. So I, so I hit him? Like, do I attack him? Like, I don't even know what that means. Uh, it's a lot to grasp, like, right away. 
So it kind of goes both ways. And that's kind of where it comes down to where you have to kind of know the player. You know, is this a player who's going to feel more comfortable having a lot to rely on and having a lot to hang on to? I've definitely had players come in and they were happy to have pages of backstory to read because for them it was like reading a fantasy novel and then they got to play in the fantasy novel. And then I've had other players where like I could give them like three sentences of backstory and they didn't read it. Like not even read it and then just forgot it, just straight up were like, oh yeah, I didn't read any of that. Um, I forgot my character sheet in the car. Like, all right, cool. Uh, so you kind of have to know. Now a new campaign, if you're bringing, you know, again, if you've got veteran players, they might not be keen to start a new campaign if they've already got one going. So it may depend on your situation. All right. Amazingly, despite the fact that I always use a timer for my classes, I have not once this MAGFest remember to start it. So I'm going to briefly check my time here. Yes. Session zero. I agree. Thank you very much, person I have never met before. One of my players. Uh, session zeros are very handy. Um, in fact, I do that for all of, for pretty much any game that I do. Uh, I have a session zero where all of the players come together and they all make characters. Uh, and this is the part where we talk about the setting, we talk about any of the like house rules that we're doing for that particular game. Uh, and it's also where we just build the characters. I like to have my players build characters you know, more, not necessarily together per se, but with each other because there's only so many times I can run a campaign and like three people show up playing the same character. It's like showing up at a party wearing the same outfit and it's like, ooh, you're also a, ooh. I think the worst example of that is uh, I was at a game and two players had decided to be the growly, like tough guy that doesn't say anything. And they, we, literally 15 minutes of two people trying to outsnarl each other. Just, all right, who are you? I don't think you need to know that. Who are you? Well, I'm not gonna tell you because you don't need to know. Fine, I don't really care. Me either. God, just kiss. But yeah, 15 minutes of that and I was like, I really gotta start just doing like a game, like a character thing. And it's actually worked out pretty well because then you know, people are like, hey, I've got this character idea, I've got this character idea. But then some people don't, you know, they don't have that idea. They wanna know like, oh, well, what are you playing? Okay, so you're doing the fighter, so I won't do that. Oh, we don't have a healer, maybe I'll play a healer. Works out pretty nicely. All right, so you're like, okay, so we chose the game, but what kind of adventure? Well, I already talked a little bit about streamlining character creation. Uh, yeah, you can just make character sheets for the players. I, I do that even for some of my veteran players if I have a particular campaign set up, uh, just because it's so much easier. Um, but, you know, certainly many people do like to have their own characters, and certainly with Dungeons and Dragons, I mean, half the fun is, you know, the dice go clackety-clack, and then, you know, you pull, that, you pull the jackpot arm to see whether or not you get the good stats. Uh, but you can streamline that. Uh, instead of just saying, like, okay, well, here's an entire book of options, take a look through over the next two to four months, you know, say like, okay, well, do you want to play someone who's like, you know, a fighter? Do you want to play somebody who uses magic? It's like, oh, I want to play someone who uses magic. It's like, cool. Do you want to play like healing magic or like killing people magic? And then just simplify it from there. Put it together. Give them some options. Certainly, I wouldn't suggest, you know, shoehorning a uh, player into a particular character type. But it, sometimes, you know, there's the, the paradox of choice. Too little choice, bad. Too much choice, also bad. Considering your adventure, you might want to consider whether you want it to be a simple adventure or a complex adventure. Now, a simple adventure, yeah, cool. Here's your adventure. The local king, uh, princess got captured by a dragon. Go fight the dragon, save the princess. In fact, if you wanted to, you could call the dragon Bowser, and you can call the princess Peach, and everyone already knows what's going on. You take some mushrooms and you're great. Very simple, easy to latch onto. Now this can be advantageous because a simple adventure gives you time to go through the mechanics, gives people time to work things out. People don't have to ask like, well, what do I do now? Because in a simple adventure, usually it's pretty simple. You have a goal, you're supposed to do what, you're, you, what you need to do to get that goal. Okay, so I take this ring and throw it in a volcano, no problem. On the other hand, a complex adventure, if you've got a player who's willing to kind of get stuck in a complex adventure, might be more their speed because it allows for them to really investigate the world and get the role-playing aspect, get the you know, interactions, the role-playing parts. Maybe they, they will enjoy the part where 
they have to be in the world and they don't just have to follow the marker. They don't just have to, you know, oh, what's next on my quest log? You know, do this, okay, go here. Uh, you know, it's, there it can differ from playing like, I don't know, Skyrim or something where sometimes you don't even need to remember what you were doing, you just walk to the map marker and then just like a thing happens. Uh, so you may need to consider like which one would work out better. What I find very handy is to start with a fairly simple adventure that I can make complex on the way. Because then, as the players are playing, they get a feel for what's going on, I get a feel for how they're reacting to the difficulty level, and I can subtly complicate things as we go along, adding on more things as we go. Good advice for any GM, plan. I believe it was Winston Churchill who said, uh, in war I have found plans to be useless, but planning to be uh, like un, uh, impossible to do without, which would have been way more inspiring if I had remembered the whole quote from the beginning, sorry. Uh, yeah, plan, you know, be ready, like, okay, so if they're going into a town, you know, have some of those notable NPCs ready to go. If they're going to get into a fight between the town and the, you know, Mines of Moria, make sure you've got, like, okay, there's going to be, like, ten orcs, and they're going to have this kind of stuff, and they've got these hit points. Have that stuff all ready to go. But also expect that it's not going to be especially helpful, because it's going to go off the rails. Uh, but having that stuff, having that stuff planned out means that you have that fallback. And if you need to, you can just kind of move those notes around. And it means that you can be quicker on your feet, keeps the player engaged. Also, that builds a lot of confidence in the part of the player. Like, oh, okay, so stuff happens and, you know, you, get, you keep the, the momentum going. Uh, but expect things to go off the rails. New players, they come up with the weirdest stuff. I mean, regular role players come up with the weirdest stuff. But after a while, veterans tend to get used to what they can and can't do. New players don't know what they can and can't do. They don't know what will or won't work. They don't know what, you know, if you've got like a bunch of orcs rampaging at you, you know, that you should either flee or fight. But, you know, what if they just like started waving a white flag? Mm -hmm. Most of my veteran players would never do that, but a new player might. And then you've got to consider, okay, well, geez, now what do we do? And you work with it from there. Cool? Makes sense? Yeah. Although, generally speaking, like with any D&D game or any role-playing game, like how often do things actually go according to plan? Anybody's plan, for that matter. By the way, um, this is actually an example of a character sheet uh, that I simplified for some new players. Um, I was running, it's, uh, you may recognize elements of this as being second edition or you know, f even first edition Dungeons and Dragons, but I decided to make it like a pirate time period, like an age of exploration. But uh, I've had people ask me like, if I had examples of simplifying character sheets or changing up character sheets. And I actually did find one for this particular uh, instance. And you can see I color-coded the dice rolls because second edition Dungeons and Dragons was very all over the place in what you needed to roll high, what you needed to roll low. Stat skill checks, you rolled low to succeed, but combat checks, you rolled high to succeed. Uh, so I just started color-coding them because I had a color printer. Uh, and I put like little notes on the sides. Uh, this was a character sheet that I made ahead of time, so everything was all set and ready to go for them, including a suggested backstory, because sometimes players have a hard time coming up with a backstory. And I just, you know, suggested, if they didn't like it, I'm like, then just cross it out, write in whatever you want, change elements that you wanted to, change the name if you wanted to. I, this, one, this guy is uh, Juan Valentino, which I kind of like, but if the person was like, well, I don't want to play Juan Valentino, I want to play Juanita Valentino, or I want to play Juan... Bolero, you know, whatever. Bolero? It's a jacket, Mike. Mm. Uh, and, but I also broke down all their combat stuff, did all of this stuff ahead of time. Now, this does make it a confusing looking sheet, but, you know, if you can say like, you know, don't worry, when you need this, this is there, this is there, the color coding I think really helps it out. And especially in a digital age where most, most uh, character sheets are digital anyway, you can color code it. Questions about my character sheet? It's pretty, right? All right, so you're like, okay. We got the players, we got the game, we got the plans, we bought some Doritos, pizza's on the way. How do we present the first session? Consider length. Uh, you know, once upon a time, I used to have gaming sessions that were 12 hours long. 
I am no longer a high school student and neither are my friends and we cannot afford that kind of time in a single day. Uh, but also new players don't have the same sort of like um, uh, uh, endurance for gaming. Like it's hard to sit down and pretend to be an elf for four hours. Uh, and so you might consider a shorter session. Do like, you know, two hours, something like that. It's like the length of a movie. Uh, so consider your length. Access, uh, consider accessibility. Weirdness and war stories to a minimum. I, n a number of times, you know, I go to some friend of mine is like, oh yeah, we've got this gaming group, you should come and hang out. And I show up and easily 60% of the game is listening to people tell me war stories about what's been going on in the game or their other characters. And aside from the fact that I'm like, that's all cool, but like, we've only got so long in the game here. Um, for someone who's new, war stories can, become, can be both inspiring, but they can also be intimidating. They can take a long time. Uh, they can be a little weird. Uh, one particular thing that happened to me, uh, a friend uh, years ago, a buddy of mine uh, was like, oh, Mike, I just moved into this new house and we set up the basement into this cool gaming setup. You've got to come check it out. My gaming group is meeting. And I was like, cool, dude, yeah. I go there and I walk down and the basement is dimly lit by a predominantly candlelight. The walls are velvet covered and blades from on every wall, swords, knives, a couple of axes. Was it cool? Yes. Was it vaguely intimidating? Also yes. And like, I was cool with it. I knew the guy. I knew all the people that were there. Uh, but I was also like, wow, if I didn't know what was going on here, I'm not sure what conclusion I would draw. This is, it reminded me of, of all things, if anyone remembers the old Jack Chick tracks, like the D&D is evil stuff, it looked like one of those panels, and I was kind of like, do we want to lean into this stereotype? Uh, yeah, so if I was, was going to bring in a new player, even if I had this sweet gaming setup, which was admittedly sweet, beautiful table, plenty of you know, space, uh, lots of ambiance, especially for like a vampire game, uh, that would not be where I hosted a game for new players. I would not invite a new player into my death dungeon uh, as cool as it is. You know, you want to keep things nice, comfortable, especially if you don't know the new player terribly well. You know, bring them in, kitchen table, lots of natural light, easily accessible exits, you know, that sort of thing. Um, also, if you have a friend who's a role player who maybe is a little, uh, we'll call it extreme, maybe rein in the extreme role player when the new player comes in. Just to remember, you want to make this accessible to new players. And having someone who's a little over the top may be intimidating, may put them off a bit. Make sure everybody is comfortable. Cheat sheets are super handy. In fact, I find cheat sheets handy for veteran players as well. Um, and, okay, back when I had like people at an actual house who would come over in person, uh, I would use little card stands for reminders of like, what can I do in a single round? You can do this, 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 this. Uh, you know, how do I calculate FACO if I needed it? You know, what are the things that I need to remember? Oh, a combat round is this long. Uh, you know, you can do this, this, and this. In order to do this, you need to do this. Just quick, easy reminders. New players, this way they don't have to ask people if they're like, oh, you know, which dice do I roll for initiative? Oh, it's right there on the thing. Uh, likewise, if you, can, uh, you can also provide cheat sheets for their character sheets. So if you've got a new player coming in and they're playing a spellcaster, print out the you know, five spells that they know with their full details. This way they don't have to flip into the book. They don't have to worry about it. It's just right there. It's like, oh, I can cast locate object. What does that do? Oh, according to this, it locates an object. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, space out your mechanics. Uh, if you don't need someone to know how something in the game works, don't worry about it. They don't need to know every mechanic right out of the gate. I oftentimes with new players, especially with Dungeons and Dragons, because it is so combat focused, I may start off with a simple sort of tutorial round of combat. It's very much like in a video game, you know how there's always that like intro section where the enemies are incredibly underpowered, can't possibly hurt, hurt you enough. And then you can, can like figure out, okay, I go this way to walk this way and this way to walk this way. Smack the goblin. Ah, oh, that's how it works. Uh, I've had many goblins die on the plains of Tutoria. 
And then it gives us a chance to work out the combat mechanics. Or if I have players that I think might be more interested in the role playing aspect than the combat aspect, you know, you can do some simple role playing and then you can introduce a simple like, okay, roll a charisma check to see if this person believes you. Roll a dexterity check to see if you, you know, can do this simple thing. Or roll an ability check to do, I don't know, play the flute or whatever. Uh, and then hold off combat for later. You know, if you don't need it right now, don't worry about it. Uh, front loading a lot of the mechanics, I mean, it's helpful to let people know that there's, there are rules for things, but you don't need to tell them everything at once. It just gives you that overload. No need for it. Uh, one thing that I find helpful for new players, and especially, especially shy new players, is presenting options. So if you're going around the table and you've got maybe some veteran players or not, but you might be like, okay, so first round of combat, you know, what are you going to do? What are you going to do? What are you going to do? And then you get to the new player and you're like, what are you going to do? And they're like, well, I, I have no idea what to do. I mean, I've never done this before and I certainly have, have no familiarity with, you know, what to do when kobolds are stealing the wagon, wheels off my wagon. Um, attack? But you can provide options. Like, okay, so what do you do? Do you attack the kobolds? Do you go for cover? Do you protect your friend? Or something else? I always want to include that option D, that none of the above, that something else. Because this gives them options. Okay, I can attack, I can run for cover, I can help my friend, or I can come up with that other thing. And that's fine. I want people to come up with their own thing, but I don't want anyone to ever be stuck. And then, with all of this stuff in mind, try to also relax and have fun. It's a game, right? <laughs> you want to have fun. Never get so tangled up in the rules. Never even get so tangled up in trying to make everything perfect for a new player that you forget to have fun. You know, otherwise it just seems like you're putting on a show. And okay, maybe it's a little bit as performative. Uh, but you want to relax. You want to have fun. You want to make sure that they're, or you want them to have fun too. But if they're having all the fun, you got to have fun too. And if you're having fun, they'll have fun, right? That's what happens when you hang out with friends. They have fun, you have fun. And if it doesn't work out, maybe at the end you're just like, so what do you think? And they're like, hey, you know, it's all right. You know, I didn't have a great time or whatever. You know, talk about it. Just be like, hey, you know, what worked? What didn't work? And if it doesn't work out, that's okay. Not everybody has to, you know, role play. Not everybody has to, you know, enjoy the delightful sound of rolling dice. Uh, maybe, but, you know, talk about it. Well, you know, would you prefer a different game? Would you prefer a different world? You know, we play Dungeons and Dragons. Would you prefer, you know, some vampire? Would you prefer some Star Wars? Uh, you know, or something like that. Uh, maybe the person will say yes. Maybe the person will say no. But it's okay. They don't have to be involved. And it's also okay if they just don't like role-playing. Not everybody does. I mean, I don't get it, but... Uh, but yeah, but it's okay. All right, which actually brings me around to questions and answers, uh, of which I, um, and also th thank you. I should have really put a questions and answers slide up because now I've, thank you for clapping, but also a question, yes. When three years old? Yeah, he's three right now. Uh, so I'm uh, Last year. Um, hmm. Interestingly enough, I actually do have a class called Running RPGs for uh, Teenagers and Kids. Kids and Teenagers. Um, Part of that depends, you gotta know your audience. Part of that depends on the kid. Uh, for some kids, like I mean, I started playing Dungeons and Dragons when I was nine, I think. Um, and I didn't quite get all of it. Uh, but I also had an older brother who played Dungeons and Dragons, which, you know, I wanna do what my old brother does. That seems totally cool. Uh, I think if I had tried earlier than that, that would've been hard. But at the same time, I've also worked with people who were 10, 11, 12, or 13 who, you know, they don't quite have that knack for tabletop role playing. Uh, in some cases, it's just, you know, not their thing, or they don't have the attention for it, or they haven't quite reached that point of maturity to kind of have like a group experience. Um, but at the same time, I've also met eight-year-olds who totally could. So. Uh, so in that sense, you've got a lot of, you know, I mean, you know how it is with kids. Like, 8 to 13, it's a gamble. Like, who knows who's going to be at what point, at, one, at what stage. Um, and certainly, you know, I am no expert on children, um, especially the smaller ones. Uh, 
uh, teenagers, certainly. Uh, role playing can be used for a lot of um, a lot of like I don't know, I don't know if I want to say social adjustment because it makes it sound like it's a correction, uh, but it's a great way to experience to like show a kid like well here's how things happen here's how people relate to each other here's how you know cause and effect things work, um, so I think you may have a few years to plan that first adventure. Uh, <laughs> I mean. You know, if, if they're old enough to knock some dice over, I, I mean, in many ways, they're set to go. Just, you know, give them a fighter. It's nothing complicated. Um, I mean, for a while, I had my cat uh, GMing. She did great. She would roll dice. <laughs> Players liked it because, you know, she, didn't, she wasn't real fussy about, like, you know, keeping track of hit points. Um, but, yeah, I think, I think until you're looking at, like, 8, 9, 10, then you can kind of start, you know, gauging... Uh, and it's certainly, you know, the moment that they're starting to read, you know, the, the moment they pick up like a fantasy novel, uh, that's usually a good sign. Yes? How do you trap them? How do you trick them into this? That is, that's the most important part, is don't come off weird. because It's like, listen, you're going to sit here and you're going to pretend to be a dwarf mage, or else. The only, the only other thing I can imagine is a bunch of dice and a pizza and like a box held up by a stick. Just be like, all right, as soon as he goes for the pizza, you pull the thing out, and all he can do is roll dice to get out. Uh, put dice on the pizza. Don't put dice on pizza. That is your PSA. Um, but that is an excellent question. Uh, as, as, as hilarious as it is to joke about tricking someone into role playing, um, I think it's actually better to just be direct. Just be like, hey, you know, maybe you've got some people coming over for, for gaming anyway, and you can be like, hey, we're going to be playing some Dungeons Dragons. Do you want to come and hang out with us? Do you want to, you know, even play? Just be direct. Um, one thing that happened to me is, uh, you know how you have, like, friends of friends? You know them, but they're not the kind of people that you call to hang out with. But when you hang out with friend A, they're always, like, you, that's where you see them. So I had this friend. His name was Rich. I have no reason to obscure his name for this. He's, he's a great guy. He was a great guy. He unfortunately passed away. Um, so uh, Rich, like he was always that guy that was over for like parties and stuff, but he wasn't part of my gaming group. He was friends with one of my gamers. Uh, and he was a great guy, totally cool. Never showed any interest as far as I could tell in gaming. Just never seemed terribly interested in it. Uh, and then through a bizarre series of circumstances, Rich and I ended up hanging out, just the two of us, and we were kind of talking. And, uh, and I was like, oh yeah, you know, I play some gaming. And he's like, you know, I always wondered about that. I was like, you, what? Like, I've sort of known you for, like, eight years, man. You've never talked about anything besides cars and hockey, like, and, and not even, like, you know, a role-playing game about cars or hockey, which I assume exists. Auto Duel definitely does exist. Sorry, Car Wars is the role-playing game. I assume there's one for hockey. Uh, yeah, and it just took that direct conversation, and he was like, yeah, I just, I never really wanted to, like, m like, butt into anybody else's thing. I was like, that's what you've been hanging on to for eight years, man. Let's get you some dice and a character sheet, and let's let's go. Um, yeah, and then he d he became a great gamer. He was a and he took to role playing like a duck to water. It was great. Um, so it just took that direct conversation, uh, and sometimes that conversation could have gone differently. He could have just been like, "Yeah, you guys do that," and it always just kind of seemed like your thing. So that's my advice. Yes. Oh, you're welcome. Yes. Yes. Oh, what if the new player is a little too much? Ooh. Uh, that can be tough. It's like, yes, we want the new player, but then it's like, oh no, what have we done? Um, and that can be tough. My experience with new players is generally not that. Most of the, the new players, they're, they're either as boisterous as the people around them, or they're actually a little more shy. Uh, but yeah, sometimes you get that person who's like, oh, I get a chance to like orate. This is my chance to like be in the spotlight and show off and all that stuff. 
Um, there is a level of like embracing it that you can do, and certainly you know you want them to have a good time. Um, I don't think that a session that has veteran players and a new player should be like the new player power hour. Um, everybody should still be getting their turn in the spotlight. Uh, and so I think you, you, know, you want to encourage the engagement, but you do want to tamp down any prima donna qualities. Um, you, know, you don't want to just keep giving them the spotlight at the expense of other players. Um, and then maybe even if at the end you're like, hey, did you have a good time? And they're like, yes, that was awesome. I got to like totally own noobs. I guess you wouldn't say for a tabletop game, but um, maybe then you can start discussing like, hey, let's run a game with just you, or let's you know see if the other players are also keen to have that person back, uh, because you don't want to bring in a new player at the expense of your veteran players. Ideally, everybody's cool, but not everybody has to role play together. Uh, just in the same sense that not everybody has to role play, not everybody has to role play together. Uh, so you could do a separate game with that person, or like if a few people from the veteran group are cool with that person, but others aren't, split, well, maybe not split the party, that's not always a great idea, but you can split the team. Uh, and then you've got twice as many gaming groups, which depending on your schedule is a good or bad thing. So but that may be a very much case by case basis. Yes? Congratulations. And, um, so the group that I'm going to be running for has a wide array of different experience levels from a partner, from a good friend, from a small time player like myself, and then from some of my other friends, who's like the second and third actual session. What they're getting into. The only place I want to talk about the character map is Jack O'Connor. Do you recommend people that you see the other characters like behind the screen? So my advice from one GM to another is cheat all the time, constantly. In fact, never not cheat. Um, I mean, you can fudge the dice or not, that's your own thing. But if there's anything you can do to make your job easier, do it. GMing is hard work. That's, that's I mean, that's part of the reason why we like doing it, because we get to do the stuff. Um, but uh, yeah, so if you've, if you've got players playing complex characters, keep, you know, give yourself some notes. If you've got players who are newer and they want to play simpler characters, then that's cool. You know, newer players, simpler character, more experienced characters, maybe they want something a little bit more complex. Um, I would definitely keep notes. Uh, because when, when you're playing the game, certainly there's always that you know, we, we've all, I think, run into that player who's like, oh, my character uses this obscure power that allows for this obscure effect, which gives me a plus 16 in this exact specific circumstance. You know, ah, I've got a ogres, I've got a plus four dagger against ogres. Um, and that's fine, they can have that. Uh, but there's also something very beautiful and simple about like, I'm a fighter and I have a sword and the sharp end goes in the other guy. Uh, and so both of them can have their time in the sun, and both of them, as they go on, like will develop their own particular elements, and they can work together. Sometimes what you need is that, like, you know, you need someone who can do anything. Like, there's nothing more versatile, I think, than the most generic of characters. It's the quality of being generic. Uh, but then when you have these especially specific complex characters, they get to do one thing really well, and everybody else gets to do many things reasonably well. Uh, so you can actually, like, if you work the, the party composition, you can actually end up with that sort of, uh, you know, group of, I don't know, group of linemen and then a couple of blitzers. That's not a football reference. That's actually a Blood Bowl reference. Thank you. I knew zinging football would get me some cred. Um, so you can ma uh, make it work that way. Um, and certainly then, especially if the versatility that the... Um, that the newer players, the, the simpler characters get, as long when uh, they get that chance to shine, uh, that can really, that should ideally keep them from feeling like they're underpowered or like they're underappreciated. Uh, compared to like more complex characters that might have like a superpower that does this you know, particular thing well. And you as a GM may have to balance that. Um, because sometimes, you know, if you've got somebody who's like, oh yeah, I'm a combat monster. Like they just walked in with a character that just like cuts through enemies like butter. Well, then maybe if the other characters are like, you know, spell casters or support casters or do things are, are extremely useful out of combat, then they can balance it out. So, cool. Thank you. Good question. Any other questions? Yeah. Um, 
Oh yeah, you're right, I do that. <laughs> um, for those who, who don't hear this, and this is something I do, I mean, it's more apparent when we're in person. Um, I always have a piece of, of blank paper next to me when I game, and every time people sit down, I write down the names of all of the characters in the order around the table, and then I like write notes under them. And that it partly is because I'm an excellent GM who takes very good notes and definitely wants to be able to refer to everything precisely, but it's also because I have a terrible memory. Uh, I mean, I can barely remember people's real names, let alone like, you know, their fake names. So I'm like, all right, all right. And then I can always just like glance down. And it's like, oh yeah, one, two, three seats. Oh yeah, you know, Elfington Von Wizardton the third. Obviously I knew that. Yes, that's definitely you. Of course, if like we break for pizza and they come back and sit back in the wrong seats, uh, that's a mess. I'm just kidding, nobody ever, d what's that? Index cards actually have had name cards for like larger games uh, where the players themselves didn't know each other terribly well. I actually made name cards uh, so that way everyone could just have their character's name in front of them and then the players didn't have to themselves remember it because I know sometimes my players will also do something similar so they can keep track of everyone's name. So I have done name cards before. It's almost like planning a wedding. You know, it's like, okay, so, you know, the wizard table has to be over here, and the fighter table has to be over here. The cleric table, we need three cleric tables where they're all fight. And then we throw the bouquet. <laughs> all right, I think I have a little more time here. Any other questions? Yes? So, what do you do about, I don't know if this comes with this, but what about Ooh. people who work in the hobby one time, and dropped out, want to get them back in, my deep secret is that most of these things work for every player. Um, in fact, after, after putting this class together and talking about all this stuff and, and working on some of the stuff to like, work with the new players, and especially when I started working with, um, uh, with the kids at the library, I started implementing that stuff for my regular players. Like I have players who can literally quote three different players' handbooks to me and have been playing for you know, 30 years and I will still give them a character sheet that reminds them which things have to roll high or low or whatever. Because if they don't need it, they don't need it. But if they do want it, it's right there. Uh, and it's actually easier. Then I just use the same character sheet you know, over and over again, uh, or the same template over and over again. Um, and honestly, I'll, I also have a friend who's been playing for 30 years, and he still is a little shaky on like, some of the particulars, just because he never, never really internalized them the way some of the rest of us did. Uh, so like he'll still ask like oh wait you know especially now that we have two different versions of D and D you know fifth edition you roll so in order to pass a skill check you roll high like that's different from second edition uh, so having those reminders super handy um, but in terms of bringing somebody back back into the fold once they've gone astray to the regular world um, I don't know uh, that may be a you know have a chat see why they stopped in the first place uh, I find that most people who you know uh, there are two things when I talk to people that they say about Dungeons and Dragons because when I say things like I go to work and I'm like oh I have to take off for work because I have to go to a D&D &D conference and they're like nerd um, I'm kidding they don't they don't know what D&D &D is um, but I'm like yeah you know Dungeons and Dragons a lot of times I hear oh I used to play that when I was a kid and so people stop playing because they think they outgrew it and it just they ne it never occurred to them that adults also play Dungeons and Dragons and so sometimes all it takes is like, uh, yeah, we still do it. You know, want to try it out? Uh, you know, you want to get back into it? Some people don't, you know, it's just like anything else. Um, and then the other thing is, uh, oh, geez, I just forgot what it was. It was, um, isn't that for kids? And, uh, oh, just too busy. Like, they used to play, but then they, like, graduated college and had to get, like, a nine-to-five job and had, you know, three kids and a mortgage and six cars and a partridge and a pear tree and... You know how much work partridges are, so they just ran out of time. And so sometimes, you know, again, it's just like, oh, well, you know, do you have time now? And sometimes the answer is no. <laughs> They're like, no, I'm working on a, you know, space needle. I'm like, okay, fine. Um, so yeah, so those are the two things that I find most common when it's somebody who, who had it and dropped it. Or less common is, oh yeah, I used to game, but then something went wrong. Huge fight with somebody, or like, oh yeah, I. A surprising number of times I've had, I used to, be, I used to play Dungeons and Dragons because I was dating the, a person who was in it and then we broke up and then I stopped playing. 
I'm like, oh, that is so sad. You don't need them, but you can use some dice. <laughs> so, you know, but finding out the reason why, you know, maybe that's what all that it'll take to get them back in. And, uh, and back on the path to healing. All right, great questions. Yes? For new GMs? Yeah. Um, <laughs> I don't know if I want to go down in history as the person who told all, said all GMs should cheat. But it's not a bad idea. Um, yeah, uh, if you're a new GM, uh, certainly, obviously, know your audience. The more you know about your players, uh, the better. Um, one of the things that's convenient about veteran players is that you can kind of guess where they're going to go and do stuff. But if you have new players, you can't guess, which is also nice, uh, but is chaotic. Um, my advice for new GMs is uh, don't sweat the small stuff. Keep things rolling. Uh, every edition of Dungeons and Dragons that has ever come out has included some variation of the rule that as the GM you're allowed to change any rule in the book as long as it is for the betterment of the game. And that's true of virtually every role playing game book that's come out. Uh, so stand by it. Uh, whatever you think is going to be most fitting, whatever you think is going to be most fair, uh, and sometimes whatever you think is going to be just most interesting. So there are times where I, I just didn't know a rule and somebody was, or I knew that there were rules, but I was like, I don't want to look it up or they're complicated. Has anybody ever tried to use the grappling rules for Dungeons and Dragons? Is that still, is that, st is that still a mess? Five, okay. Because I've looked at it for four different other editions. I haven't checked it for five because every one of the other four were garbage. Uh, so yeah, so as soon as somebody like is like, okay, I'm gonna wrestle them. I'm like, oh, okay, I am not looking in the book. We're just gonna, you know, regular attack, strength, damage, something like that, you know, and just, yeah, you know, just whatever it takes to kind of like move things along in a fair and reasonable way. Uh, so don't sweat the small stuff. If you don't remember something, don't worry about it. If there's a point of contention where the player's like, oh, well, the rule book says this, you know, and you're like, oh, well, I thought it was that. Yeah, if what the player says is fair, then go with it. If it seems like they're trying to like, you know, work things too much in their advantage, you know, look it up. It's not a big deal. Um, but don't sweat it. Uh, a number of times we've had, uh, I've had things come up where, um, you know, as a GM, like I said, I, I do GM with someone who can quote me like three different players' handbooks, just of D&D &D alone. Um, and actually, that's kind of handy because I'll just say like, hey, Jesse, what's the, you know, what's the rule for this? And he's like, uh, in second edition, uh, I think a paladin's save is five at this level. I'm like, cool, that's what it is. Let's do that. Uh, and just keep it moving. And as long as you're fair and as long as you're reasonable and as long as, and it helps if you're just ever so slightly on the player's side, uh, I've never had a, had a particular problem. Um, I have had problems where I was the player and the GM was recalcitrant uh, because I was trying to do something and he said, the rules are this. And I was like, but that doesn't make sense based on what was going on. It actually became kind of a rolling argument that was not helped by the fact that it was like one in the morning. We were all exhausted. Um, but it was just, it was one of those things where I had like this big beefy character and the person I wanted to get to was behind a row of like ordinary people. And I was like, oh, I'm just gonna like smash through the line and grab this guy. He's like, well, the rules say that you can move and act or you can act and move and you'd have to move to the, you know, low people or to the, the short pe or the regular people and then attack them and then next turn you can move onward. And I'm like, yeah, but the guy's gonna be gone. I don't wanna attack these people. I just wanna ignore their presence and barrel through them like the Hulk because I'm playing the Hulk. Uh, that went on for quite a while. Uh, and what happened, what was that? Yeah. Um, and so what I would have done in that situation if our position had been reversed, I probably would have called for like a few strength checks or something or like, you know, maybe an attack roll against the intended target with minuses. There were a lot of ways. In fact, I typed out a lot of ways for that because I was very upset. Uh, and we ended the session without that being resolved. In fact, <laughs> I think somewhere I still have this series of things you can do instead of what the stupid rules said. I was not happy. Uh, next session, we, you know, we talked it out. Well, first of all, we were all like, wow, we were really tired. Um, but we talked it out and we, we came to a, a reasonable consensus. Um, I don't remember exactly what that was because it wasn't nearly as interesting because there was no contention. Um, but yeah, like in that situation, and it's on you. And ultimately it's the GM's call. So, you know, if you had ultimately said it's gotta be this, you know, then I'm like, all right, well, it's gotta be that. Um, whatever you think is fair. So don't sweat the small stuff. This is always good advice, I think. 
All right, I think I have time for one more question. Yeah, yes. Uh, that's an excellent question. Uh, how do you make new players feel more seen? Um, in many cases, it helps as a GM uh, remember that they are actually in the scene. I mean, the best way to be seen is to remember that they're there. Um, but that means that NPCs should also see them. Uh, now, NPCs, they act like people, and sometimes people ignore other people and so forth, but there's no reason that they can't interact with these new players. And so if you've got a player who's willing to role play, it's not everyone is keen to jump into that, but if they're willing to, yeah, have people go up and be like, oh, hey, you look like a person that I should talk to or whatever. Um, and if they're missing backstories, suggest some. Or if they provide none and they're, or just very generic ones like, oh yes, you know, I'm from a small town and I came to the big city to make my money as a mercenary, you know, whatever, simple. Um, make it up for them. Uh, and then as you go, you can just be like, oh yeah, you get a letter from your parents saying, you know, oh, the farm is burned down, you know, or whatever. Um, and you can actually just put in the backstory for them. Uh, depending on your player, you can either kind of spring this on them. Uh, or if they're the, you know, as the player gets more comfortable with the world, just be like, hey, I'm going to start introducing stuff from your backstory. Do you have any thoughts that you want to be there, or do you want me to just make it for you? Um, there's also uh, random tables online that you can just roll up a random backstory. It's always handy. Uh, yeah, but just, you know, remember to make them a part of the thing. Non-player characters will get involved with them. Um, and make sure it's, you know, something that they want. Some people, when they get, get first get started, they don't want to role play as much because they're afraid of doing something wrong. Or they keep the role playing very simple. And that's fine. They can warm up to it. Uh, but yeah, just make them as much a part of the world as anything else, just as regular people are. All right. I think that actually brings me to the end of my time. So one last final question. Yeah, ab absolutely. Like I said, you know, giving players options where it's like, do you want to A, B, C, or D? And D is always none of the above. Um, just be like, oh, do you, know, do you want to talk to the tavern master? Do you want to wait outside? Do you want to steal somebody's coin pouch? Or do you want to do something else? I wouldn't include the steal coin pouch if you don't want them to take that. Be prepared for them to choose your options. Um, but yeah, giving options, a fantastic idea. Um, all right, if you haven't had enough of me, tomorrow uh, I am also teaching Building a Better Hero, which is about making player character heroes more interesting and more involved and more in-depth. Uh, I will be here, but I will be here at 10, 10 to 11. Mm, I, I don't, actually. 10 to 11, yes. I didn't make an extra slide for that one. So 10 to 11 a.m. tomorrow, I'll be talking about building a better hero. Uh, thank you very much. I have and remain Captain Mike, and uh, thank you very much for coming out.